All right, we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Artist in Residences. This is the Baton Rouge Gallery's twice a week check in with artists of all kinds. Um, today is Tuesday, and some of you might be picking up on this pattern. Tuesday is a deep dive discussion day. Um, so I'm going to have on two artist members at Baton Rouge Gallery, um, and we are going to talk all about the ins and outs of printmaking. This is very exciting for me as this is my meeting. So I'm getting ready to be nerdy with these two wonderful artists. Um, before I bring them on, I just want to say thank you to all of our members and donors. Um, because of our community, we can bring you this kind of content and we still have stuff to do during quarantine. Um, and I think these discussions are worthwhile and they're interesting to, to folks of all stripes. So um, if during this uh, discussion about printmaking, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. Um, I can see them and we can um, answer them in real time as you ask them. Um, and I'm also gonna encourage our guests today who is Leslie Kopcho and Ross Yonke. Um, they are also encouraged to go back after the feed and answer questions that we don't get to during the discussion. So please, if at any point you're confused or you wanna know more about a specific thing that we're talking about, let us know, we can answer you. Um, I also want to thank Breck, who's been our partner for a couple of decades now. Um, as you know, our Baton Rouge Gallery is located inside their beautiful city park, and it is because of their partnership that we've been able to serve the community, have First Wednesdays, artist performances, artist talks, all of that fun stuff. Hopefully we'll be getting back to that soon, um, but since we can't have you in our home, these lovely artist members of ours are going to bring you into theirs. Um, I'm briefly going to introduce Leslie Kopcho and Ross Yonke. Let me show you some of their work just to give you a little context into what you're going to be looking at today. Hold on one second. There we go. Let's start with Leslie because, you know, I like ladies first. Uh, Leslie's work is um, printmaking, mixed media. She does a lot of large scale. Uh, intaglio works, which she's going to explain to us what that is. Uh, she does mix processes, so these have a combination of traditional printmaking, um, photo and digital kind of elements all blended in together to make this beautiful, rich textures that we see here. And of course, pictures can never do this kind of stuff justice, um, but these are all huge, huge plates. They're just amazing. Um, and then I want to pull that away for a second so I can pull up the work of Ross. Hold on. Again, two seconds. Let me just pull that up. Ross's work is also um, mixed media printmaking, very engaging. He uses a lot of portraiture, a lot of wood grain to liven up the surface and the texture of each work. These are also uh, fairly large mixed media between screen print. Um, I think there's a little bit of drawing in some of these and uh, relief printmaking. So that gives you kind of an idea of who we're talking to today. All right, without further ado, let me go ahead and bring them on. Hold on just a sec. Hello, Ross. Hello, Leslie. How are you guys doing today? Hi, great. Chelsea. Can you guys hear me okay? Glad to be here. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So glad to have you guys. Thank you for, for coming on today. Um, as I said in the intro, I am very excited about today's conversation, being that it seems that no one who's not an artist uh, even has any idea what printmaking is. So briefly for the audience, would both of you like to, in your own words, explain what the hell is printmaking? What is this? Well, typically you have a matrix, which could be a wood block, a piece of wood, a piece of copper. That plate is worked, right? And you would think that all of your all of your effort, that would be the piece of art. But what happens is usually a piece of paper or some sort of substrate is applied and then the image is transferred onto that substrate. That is the, the work of art. And it's in a multiple form. And I think what people have difficulty with is it's not just about repro like reproduction and make, like everything is an individual. Each print you pull from that matrix is an original print. 
because the artist intended to work with printmaking, which can make or produce multiples. So in a nutshell, you're working a matrix, it's very physical, and then it's the print, the transfer, that magic that happens that is printmaking. Uh, Ross, can you tell us what on earth is a matrix? Uh, uh, I never even saw the movie. Uh, so <laughs> The matrix is is the surface that contains the the image. The matrix you pl apply ink to in some way, and then when you put the paper on top and pull the paper off, that ink is transferred. Sometimes the ink goes through the matrix. Uh, when the matrix is a silk screen, the ink passes through the screen. Usually, though, the matrix is a, uh, a material that the ink is either on top of or it's down in the grooves. Uh, Leslie does intaglio where the ink is actually rubbed down into the surface of the that big copper plate yeah, right. right there. And so, so Leslie, what we're, what we're looking at here is a copper plate and the marks on that plate is what receives the ink. And then that is then run through a, a press generally um, to push the ink out from those wells that you've that you've carved in there via etching or actually engraving onto the paper, and the paper is the print, Correct. right? So, okay. for example, I'm trying to find like all the little cypress cypress images there. Well, actually, actually, they're resurrection ferns, mm -hmm. which I thought were pretty cool. And so they are etched into the copper. They're below the surface. The plate is wiped with ink, and then the pressure of the press on the soft, damp paper pulls that impression, and this becomes, you know, the working, the artwork, mm -hmm. and this okay. happens to be on artist-made paper. Now, um, I know that what you're showing us is a type of what we call intaglio, which is a process where the ink is pulled out from wells, but I know there are other processes in printmaking, specifically relief printing, which is kind of the opposite, which is a lot of what Ross does, right? Mm -hmm. Can you, Ross, would you mind explaining to us what relief printmaking is? Well, what relief and intaglio share is that there's high and low areas in the matrix, the block or the plate. Uh, the difference is that I roll ink on top, and so the low areas don't have ink. Leslie rubs the ink into the low areas and then pulls them out in the printing process and in her case the high areas have no ink or almost no ink on them uh, you could take one of leslie's plates and roll ink on top of it and print it and you'd get kind of a reverse image of what you saw there the the resurrection ferns would be white shapes or nearly white shapes and the background would be the green and you could rub ink into one of my blocks as she rubs ink into her plate and print it under a lot of pressure and get that ink to come out and have a reverse image of, of mine as well. That's really in the weeds, but, um, <laughs> but it, that is kind of, this is, this would be an intaglio image and it's very linear, but if we had rolled ink on top, we could print the top surface or the relief part of it. So it, so the, those kind of grayish spaces in between your lines would have the different color if you just rolled it on top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be the opposite. What I was gonna say is uh, one of the fun byproducts of these Tuesday discussions is that we can get very, very in the weeds. Um, but I know for some people in the audience, if you have, if you get lost or if you want us to pause and just break down something specifically, go ahead and write that in the comments. We can see it, we will answer it. Um, we would love to engage with you both on YouTube and on Facebook. I can see all of those comments. So do not hesitate, bring them on. Let me um, see. I was gonna add go one more thing about printmaking. You know, what is printmaking? And, and you mentioned that uh, people often don't understand it, but what's interesting is printmaking, uh, ha one, it's, it's a medium that everybody has contact with every day. Um, we read printed things, we wear printed things, we see signs and, and images that are printed all the time, uh, but we don't know how it's done. The mystery is, is the process. The other point about printmaking that's really important to everybody is that printmaking really is the thing that 
gave us democracy and elevated the proletariat, the the poor working class to um, to middle class status because the printing press gave us books that were easily available and and widely distributed, which allowed us to read, which allowed us to understand what was being said in the Bible, which allowed us to understand that maybe the king wasn't taking such good care of us, which gave us democracy. I mean, it was it's a really powerful tool in the history of the world. Uh, Gutenberg's press is probably the most important machine. Uh, if you had to pick one machine that that changed the history of humankind. Now, um, that kind of printmaking on the Gutenberg press was a type of relief, um, right. which kind of morphed into letterpress, which, you know, again, we're getting really in the weeds here. But different forms of printmaking um, have been around probably for, I'd say, as long as people have been making images. I mean, the art of stenciling has been a thing forever. You know, even cave paintings, you put your hand on the wall and push powder around it. That's that's a type of stenciling, which then over many, many, many years has moved into what we now use as screen printing. So you're right. Printmaking is everywhere and people don't tend to know what that means, especially in this age that is so digital. When one thinks of a print, they think of something that they've pulled off of their home printer. Right. But uh us nerds are stuck a couple hundred years ago manually printing things because process, right? Mm -hmm. Still drawn on rocks. If you're still drawn on rocks, you mentioned lithography. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. 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 So um, quickly, there there are four basic types of making prints, mm -hmm. um, and I know that both of you like to utilize a bunch of different types in each image. Um, do you want to talk? either of you briefly about mixing processes and why you find that appealing and then we'll answer an audience question after that okay uh well i'll uh, uh, uh so what i like and uh, the reason i do what i do is uh the woodcut really started everything for me and um what i like about that is the grain of the wood and um i'm very the one thing I'm picky about is the kind of wood I use just to get the kind of grain effect that I that I want. Uh, where the silkscreen came in is that silkscreen is the most expedient way to block in color. And I really like to uh, keep the color blocking fairly simple and then let the, the, um, the woodcut image create most of, of the content of the visual content and the, um, the in the detailed information in the print so in this one there's that wood grain all up um on his cheek and here that band right here yeah that, that banding that seems to go horizontally throughout the dark parts is is the grain of the wood um which sort of gives those solid color areas a little bit of a sparkle but the yellow the blue the orange those are just solid flat areas of color and you did those solid flat areas with silk screen, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And, um, the way it works is that there, there's four colors there. Uh, I create the wood block first, uh, but it's the last color, typically, not always, that I that I print. The wood block is that kind of violet color that's on top. Um, but I use the wood block to lay out the position of the other colors and I print the other colors first and then the wood block goes on top because that the wood block ultimately organizes the composition and provides the bulk of the information. If you saw it without the wood block, it would be pretty boring. Uh, It'd just be kind of like a mix of color shapes kind of swirling yeah, around, yeah, together, it right? Be, it would be, yeah. And it would, in this case, it would be very abstract. Uh, um, almost non-objective. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so. um, let me pull up a piece of Leslie's work here. I wish there was a quicker way to jump between sharing screens, but I think the audience can bear with me at this point. They're pretty familiar. Um, Leslie, can you tell us which processes you utilize in, in the, these works here? We'll get into a little more in the weeds uh, 
with studio stuff in just a minute, I was just curious about like how many different processes are in this one print here that we're seeing? I usually lose count because it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not about the process, but what it can be used for and like, simulate or conceptually how, how I gather information. But, but in this case, it's the bottom part is photo gravure. It's a photo and tallyo process. We showed you the, from a copper plate um, I was down here, you mean yeah, the layer that, underneath all of it. And those happen to be an image that I captured on a scanning electron microscope at the um, Department of Biological Sciences here at LSU. And so that's mm -hmm. my hair and skin. And the middle part is also that. And it's photo, like based on a photograph. And the top part is actually a digital collage element that was printed and collaged all together at the same time called Sheen Collet. Mm -hmm. So it's an amalgamation of processes. And the top image represents all, like we lost all those trees in Gustav. And I took time and I took uh, macro phot photography. I went out and took pictures of all the trees and a lot of them seemed to be weeping. And I felt like those were um, calling to me with the sense of loss from all the hurricanes, not just Gustav. That was like, you know, the third hurricane. And it just was a large, I was thinking about the sense of loss there, but I needed to take different parts and processes to put the image together. It usually comes from separate sources. So that's why I mix processes. I love ink, I love paper. So I've, I've used a lot of different tools in my work and sometimes I do forget how I did them. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. I, I imagine uh, with all of that different process, it'd be hard to keep track. Um, I want to pull in an audience question. Um, this is kind of a two parter, but I'm going to show the latter half because uh, I think it kind of makes sense on its own. This is from Jim Livingston. He's wondering if you the first part of this question was if you limit the number of prints that you sell. Um, and then this is the second part. And if you do limit the number of prints that you sell, what do you do with the matrix afterwards? So this is a process called additioning. Um, to create an addition is a finite number of prints. Usually, I don't know, artists vary a lot. My additions are small. I do about 15. Some artists do 500, 1,000. Um, do either of you limit your additions? Um, and if you do, what do you do with that matrix once it's done? Do you want to go? Or yeah, I, um, yeah, I limit I limit mine as well. Um, usually, and mine are shorter than yours, Kelsey. Mine are five to ten uh, with on the the bigger prints. Uh, and then um, the matrix. Uh, sometimes I'll hang on to the block just because uh, I can use the back side of the block. Mm -hmm. But uh, otherwise, they're never they're never used again. Um, they just kind of pile up, right? They they pile up, and then I do a cleaning, and and they go out. Uh, or yeah. The back, and then they they go out. But yeah, you 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 know, it's our responsibility to make sure that that uh, our additions are, or our our prints are unique and limited. So I you know we take I I and I shouldn't speak for Leslie, but I take care to make sure that that they can't be made again. Sure. Now, Leslie, I know your philosophy is a little bit different because the repetition and the ability to make more than one, uh, all, you know, as identical as a hand pulled print can be, but the ability to make more than one isn't necessarily the point for you. Do you want to talk about your philosophy sure. on additioning? Well, first I do, I usually do very small additions if I do an addition at all. Like if I have a project and I'm, I need to create so many prints to share with others in, an, in a trade edition, then I'm very careful about that, that matrix. But for me, it's the generative property of the matrix that's most exciting. So the fact that I can print it, I can change it, and then I can print it again and see my the history of my idea all together. The idea of states or stages, one I think of Rembrandt and his different stages because I'm never done. I'm obsessed with the image. And in that sense, it's always alive and it's always changing. So it's a property of printmaking is this idea of a generative matrix, unlike painting or other other processes that I love so much. And that I see these prints sort of as sisters or brothers or kin to one another. So they're not meant to be the same. 
but to enjoy them in comparison to one another. So if I create a series, I like the way the prints sort of talk to each other on a on the wall for per se. But I get obsessed with the image, and it's it's a very different, uh, I guess, kind of activity for me. It's very direct in that sense. Mm -hmm. That kind of leads me to this next screen I want to share. Um, of course, it, it's going to start out on the slide that I'm not starting on, but I want to come down here. Let's see if I can make this presentation. Hold on. Um, you were talking about your work being related to each other, not necessarily identical, but let's say brothers and sisters, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if I can do this without that thing and interrupting your image. There I can. Okay, great. So this would be an example of different versions that you've played with the same plates. Yeah. Uh, like thinking about right? temp temperature and, you know, that they might look really interesting together and start a visual dialogue with one another. So there might be, there, there is a repeatable element there, right? Mm -hmm. But it, mm -hmm. it's not the same. It's not meant to, I'm not telling people I, that there are 10 of these, right? Right. right. There, there's like a dozen of them that are unique, but related to one another. So what I would like to jump to now, let's see here. I'm just gonna do this the clunky way so that I can see what I'm doing. I wanna talk about um, the difference that you were both experiencing between uh, your studio spaces that you had at each of your universities, Ross being at Nichols and Leslie being at LSU. Typically a print studio, um, they're not all as big and vast as the one you see here, but they they are, they do allow for a certain amount of flat surface space, which is essential. Um, and then moving to a home studio setup, um, this is Leslie's for example, but I imagine Ross has something very similar going on uh, in his world. What has it been like in this transition moving from your all, all the stuff you have access to at the universities you teach at, to trying to make a smaller space work for your work. Yeah, it, it's it's been a bit of a challenge because the space is so small. Like I have a press and I can make prints, but I can't pick and choose all those great processes we just talked about and put them in one print or work on the scale that I often do at LSU in my home studio. So I've had to scale things back. Luckily. I was in the middle of a project, the one I kind of held up that the matrix isn't that small and I can just about get it through my through my press. But I have had to spend, you know, a number of weeks clearing things and making it more user friendly. I've tried mm -hmm. to use the time to actually collect different fibers for paper making, but I won't be able to do that work until maybe I go back to LSU. But you can, you, sure. can, you can make it work. So I've you know, some new organizational systems and I created an inks, you know, a series of ink slabs so that I can lay out more than one plate and work. So I'm kind of set to jet now, but I do have a lot of limitations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the press bed being one of them, I'm sure. Um, I wanna get to show people, we're gonna, I'll come back to some of these in just a minute. I want, this, this is the, the typical size of a Leslie Kopcho print. As you can see, they're quite, grand uh in scale and i imagine with the the smaller press you have at home you've had to sort of shift your thinking on 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 scale a little bit um and ross's work you can kind of see it behind him let's see if we can just get him yeah hold on here let's have ross be the, the only person for a minute just so we can see the size of your work behind you yeah i mean i can pick that one up that's sitting behind me but there uh i'm <clears throat> I, I don't work at school very often actually making prints. I'll do uh, the screen preparation for my prints at school and I will do um, sometimes a few other little things, but mostly I've set up to do, to make my work at, at my home studio. Uh, I live quite, a, quite far away from Nichols. I have a 70 mile commute. So it's hard for me to go back and forth and work and uh when when we moved to this house i built a studio in the backyard that can accommodate what i do so i don't have um as much dependence you know, this um change in 
lifestyle that we've gone through hasn't affected the way I, I make my work uh, at all, really. It's just affected um, how often I'm in my studio, which is a little more frequently because I don't have to drive to school every day. So this is actually potentially, you know, besides all the teaching headache, uh, this is maybe a, a more productive time for you. Yeah, you would you would think it would be more productive. <laughs> it's about the same, but uh, yeah. uh, you know, a few household projects have gotten done during this time, which has been helpful. oh, kudos to you. The best I can do is make sure I do laundry on a somewhat regular basis. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of a sense of being human and doing doing things like that. So, I mean, my yard mm -hmm. my yard cleanup yielded um, fibers for me to make paper out of it, so I felt good about sort of multitasking there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show one of your handmade paper pieces. Hold on just a second. Um, so you sent me some images, Leslie, of things you've been working on uh, at home, obviously, with a, a smaller press, more limited means to uh, to create. So this is a handmade paper yes. that you've put the uh, intaglio plate onto. Is that right? Yes. And so there's a little bit of the collage, the digital collage in there and several different um, intaglio plates. And the, the paper is made from fiber that I I collected. So it was for, no, it, was, I'm not, yeah, it was actually for a sorry. portfolio called Southern Hospitality. So the pineapple is symbol of hospitality and then um, cotton maybe having more of a sordid history, but trying to put those two together and it gave me the excuse to make make some paper and try to make the image work on paper. Now, I'm not sure if this happened for the audience, but for me, the audio kind of cut out right as you said what type of paper this is. So could you repeat that? What is this paper made from? Cotton that's been grown in Louisiana and it was from the mm -hmm. LSU Ag Center, a donation, and then pineapple that I collected from stores and put those together so they were more symbolic of the image that's on top and more in, in harmony. So the great thing about making paper is that you can custom make it. There are limits to, to paper, you know, what paper is available for printmaking. And I've been enjoying trying to explore both print and paper and sort of the, is that support. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So um, the last couple of things I want to ask you guys, since we're rounding up on the half hour mark is what has teaching been like for you? Um, both of you teach at the university level, um what what's that been like what's that experience well it's been it's been extremely different and uh, i'm i'm our de department head right now so uh i've not only had to deal with the logistics of my own classes but also with logistics for the other faculty in my program and you know and talk them work with them to solve some of the problems that we're having and um there have been some little benefits you can always find a silver lining in in things but uh it's teaching studio classes where things are hands-on and where you want to kind of walk around and just see what the students are doing and say oh well try it a little bit this way move it a little bit to the left uh, a little more ink little you know let's adjust the press all those kind of little things you just can't do uh today was final crit in beginning printmaking and they had made a a small book and um seeing the book in in the photographs even though they they did a good job taking photographs of the parts of the book i wanted to see uh was really different than the physical act of opening the book and leafing through the pages books are very intimate physical things i think leslie knows this better than i do and uh, to not be able to touch them and kind of look at them was was hard. It's, yeah, I believe that. It's it's weird. It's and it's going to be weird next fall too. It, the 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 distancing plans for the fall and it's not going to be um, normal normal teaching setup in the fall. Yeah, I because I remember especially in studio classes. This has come up often in these talks. Is that one of the things that happens in a studio class, and part of the reason why often in the college level they're three hours long, 
um, is that time working in as a group on something and just having your teacher come up behind you and point out something obvious that you're doing that needs to be improved and, and just little things like that um, are much harder to achieve from a distance learning perspective because I imagine you guys are seeing the work in process but not as it's being made and sometimes just as a final product where really all you can do is say oh well you could have done this or maybe you should have done that it's a very different thing than um not hand holding that's not the right word but that more one-on-one -on -one and then the the peer-to-peer -peer conversations that happen you know in the classroom are are so vital for learning i just i can't imagine trying to go through college or any grade level right now trying to learn from the computer I mean, you can learn a lot, let's let's be clear. I'm sure you guys are doing an amazing job teaching, but it's just so different, you know? Yeah, I think learning from videos, I mean, they're very helpful. There's no question about it. And I hope to make, you know, videos for students in the future, but there's nothing like, I mean, there's a, like, there might be a zillion operations in a demonstration and there's no way mm -hmm. to capture all of that or to repeat a small thing or to take a question. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's gaps. <laughs> Yeah. So I find yeah. that hard. That's going to be difficult. I mean, there were a lot of nice things that came out of this. I mean, I probably approached teaching slightly different. I pushed them for the print class. I pushed their drawings more. We were in the middle of intaglio, which is technical, right? So they got a little taste, but they're, they were supposed to push their plates further through different process hoops. And so they had to push their drawings and simulate what their prints might look like and how they wanted their prints to look. So the drawings came out much better than when they sketch to provide, right, a start. So that mm -hmm. was, you know, an asset. And then I had them doing, they researched a Louisiana printmaker. So there's things that I had them do that they wouldn't normally get to do. But yeah. you know, it's the last few weeks that works well, but for a whole new semester, it's going to take a lot of thinking through what's best to, you know, how to provide the material to the students. Mm -hmm. Now, Ross, I know you did uh, create a YouTube channel for your students uh, for kind of a step-by-step -step guide. How, yeah. how was their response to that? Uh, oddly enough, I, I, let me just say that during this time, so middle of March till now, I started with PowerPoints. Uh, I moved to recording Zoom lectures which was a disaster and then the youtube and they they seem to respond to the youtube videos the best and and i so i built the youtube videos around their final project this book and they're broken into small chunks that they can um you know they can look at a at a 15 minute or 10 minute video go through those steps and then then move on to the next one so that's that's been one of the good things uh, that's come out of it, uh, and something I'd like to continue is is keeping some kind of a, a a YouTube kind of video record of demos because, like Leslie said, there's a lot that they miss, but if they have to go back, or if they want to go back and get some information that they've forgotten or, or lost or are confused about, they can go back and, and look at it. I'm not sure how I'm gonna deal with it, but I'd, you know, recording things in the, in the classroom when we can be in the classroom might be the solution. Yeah, even if it's like a camera straight down onto your plate to show the process, I think that'd be fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing um, I think has been good about this uh, and and I'd like to hear what Leslie thinks. I really would. Um, is that I, printmaking is is hard for students because they get these beautiful studios that that we've set up for them, uh, that we've tried to make extremely functional for them, and then they graduate and they're in a bedroom. They don't have a press. They don't have ink. They you know all of the all of that technology goes away and convincing them to not buy an iPhone and buy a small press instead and and invest in some ink and stuff like that is is hard so I think part of the silver lining is that they've been making art all kinds of artwork at home in their own space so when they graduate and they're forced to do that 
under any circumstance, that I think they might be more capable of surviving yeah. on their own. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Leslie, do you have a response to that? Because I have a follow-up question for you specifically about an assignment. Oh, well, it might lead into that uh, to show the paper stu the student in the, her little studio. But yeah, I, I, I think some of the re like some of the things that I've done that were research based, I think the students are more interested in printmaking that like from doing that. So maybe they didn't have a chance to do everything hands on, but now they're more interested because they got to talk to a, a, a printmaker and find out how an interview much like this, right, that the students had to do. So mm -hmm. I think I mean, there's a whether so, well, there's a way. This is KK McCarley, and they are in their their little home studio, and they pulped their own old photographs. She's a photo major, and she made her own mold and decal to create. Um, I think the next slide is a piece that that they made. But you know, you can do something everywhere. So I think. That they they inspired me with that. Mm -hmm. so that. Those are all pulped photographs from from their um, photo class, and then wow. their own hair. They have this crazy, beautiful hair with all rainbow colors, and in the paper, mm -hmm. it looked great. And another student actually awesome. made masks, and those are from toilet paper, toilet paper rolls, I should say. So some of the browns of the rolls and some are gray. And so they wanted to do something thoughtful, but also figure out how to make paper at home, like down and dirty. And mm -hmm. they come up with these inventions. So when you don't have the equipment, I think you rely more on your, your instincts and what you're really interested in or we'll do the research and then you get even more excited. So we, we do get spoiled in our studios, but... Mm -hmm. But I think these are, just, these are fantastic. So this is not just taking apart a toilet paper roll, cutting it and folding it. This is actually blending it down to the paper pulp exactly. and then pulling it, reshaping it. Once it's in the shape you want, drying it, sewing it, like making a whole new thing out of these, these materials that you have around the house, like a toilet paper roll, mm -hmm. which is kind of tongue in cheek given the run on toilet paper. Well, <laughs> I, that, think I think that's how it started. It was a little tongue in cheek and then... Yeah. You know, then she started to think a little bit more thoughtfully about about mm -hmm. that. But I think your instincts kick in, and you know, just making a stew of something out of nothing, right? Truly from scratch. I think we do get spoiled even in the U.S. about our materials. Mm -hmm. Students don't know what they're made of, right? But when I go to Europe or another place, like the students really understand how to make paint, or you know, like from the mm -hmm. ground up. So. There's something yeah. to be said for independent Absolutely. independent work, but you do have to inspire the students and that's the trick, right? You can teach them all the tricks and they can have all the equipment, but I think our job is is a challenge to inspire them all the time. Yeah. And especially so in this in this situation. Yeah, that's extremely true. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for coming on. I know the three of us can probably talk forever about, you know, kitchen litho and, you know, mix process and all that. We, we can just get in the weeds, but no one's going to understand it but other printmakers. So we should probably go ahead and bring this to a close. Do you have any um, final comments, audience? If you have any last questions, get them in quick. Uh, there was one person that I want to say hi to specifically because they're coming at us from across the globe. Patrick, hello. Hopefully you stuck with us this whole time. I saw your comments. Thank you for writing in all the way from Abu Dhabi. That's amazing. Um, Leslie and Ross, uh, once we end the broadcast, I encourage both of you when you have time uh, to dig back through the comments on this video and answer the ones that, that you know, sing out to you. Um, I know there was some specifically directed at both of you that we didn't get to today. Uh, so when you can, go for it. Happy to. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and uh, sign off. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Kelsey. Nice seeing you, Leslie. Same here, Ross. 
All right, everybody, that was today's episode of Artist in Residences. I thank all of you for tuning in. Um, and for those of you watching this later, not on live, um, you can still put comments in there. I'll try to answer them. Uh, Leslie and Ross will see them later. They'll try to answer uh, the ones that they can get to. Uh, please tune in on Friday for our next episode of Artist in Residences. Uh, these Friday episodes are more of a variety hour where we bring in an artist member, a community artist or performer, and someone who's participated in our Flat Curve Gallery. Um, you can find information about all of that stuff on our website at batonrougegallery.org. You can see the website down here at the bottom ticker. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, I'm a host Friday, so I will see you later this week. Take care. Bye-bye.